All right, the next thing it says here is introduce location of job board. There is a job board, it has a location. Does anyone know where that location is? Hmm? All right, so apparently it's a job board, <laughs> and I'm supposed to look, introduce its location, but no one knows it. Um, I'm guessing it's out there where all the other stuff is. Um, has anyone put a job on the job board that needs job boarding and could just tell me no? Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the karaoke is catching up with me. So tonight there is a social event, the uh, reception, which will be in the Great Hall of the Library of Congress. It starts at 7, it goes till 9 p.m. Um, the directions to the uh, library is posted on the venue page of the conference website. Uh, light refreshments and drinks will be provided. Uh, please make sure that you and your guests bring lanyards to enter. No sharp objects, suitcases, or large bags through security. No red wine because it will stain the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Other than that, have a blast. Um, incidentally, I was talking with a friend the other day, yesterday, who lives in DC. And she was like, so where's your conference? At one of the library conference buildings? And I was like, yeah. She was, well, it's probably not the Jefferson Building because, you know, but it's the Jefferson Building. So uh, that was kind of cool. Um, apparently, it's the, it's the place you would want to have a big party if you were having a party at the Library of Congress. All right. Are, am I really running eight minutes ahead of schedule? Because the next thing is to just go straight into the fiscal continuity uh, thing which isn't supposed to start till 9.15 and it's only 9.06. Uh, I could just stand on stage here and like, no, no, all right, uh, uh, Roy vetoes my plan. All right, um, so we're gonna start day two talking about the future of Code for Lib and we've had uh, a, a, a group talking about this for a long time and doing much planning and discussion and soliciting feedback from the community. Um, and so I would like to introduce Galen Charlton, Morgan McKeon, Jamie Mears, and Shad Nelson to the stage to uh, discuss their findings. And I'm not sure if this is going to also include uh, group discussion. Uh, so Mike Runners, hmm? Yes, yeah, so Mike Runners, please uh, make yourselves ready and available. And with that, we'll introduce the Fiscal Continuity Group. Thanks. switch buildings? How do I switch it to the um, okay. camera over here? Okay, good. All right, good morning. Thank you all for coming so early to talk about fiscal continuity. <laughs> um, this talk is an update from a couple working groups in Code for Lib that are focused on improving financial sustainability for the Code for Lib annual conference. How's the sound? Can you hear me okay? Okay. And we will have lots of discussions, so we'll definitely need um, mic runners. Okay. So the purpose of the talk is just to give everyone um, information about what we've been working on and our plan for next steps, and then to have a chance for a discussion among the whole group. Our session is 40 minutes overall. And we use about half of that time for our presentation. And then the rest of the time will be Q&A with everyone. OK, so um, just to give an outline of what we'll cover in the talk, I'll start with a brief recap of the Fiscal Continuity Interest Group, which was a fact-finding group that started this work. And then I'll also update on the community vote that the Fiscal Continuity Interest Group held this past fall and the outcomes from that vote. And then next, Galen Charlton will speak about the fiscal continuity or the fiscal sponsorship working group that formed as a result of our community vote and about how the general finances and conference organization process happens for a Code for Lib conference. Uh, then Jamie Mears from the Library of Congress will talk about the experience of the local planning committee this year as a specific example of that process and what the effect would be um, of the 
changes of the, of the new process that we're proposing, like some of the effects, just to kind of put this in context. And then Chad Nelson will wrap things up by talking about next steps for the fiscal sponsorship working group, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So the fiscal continuity interest group started in response to an email discussion on the code flip list in spring and early summer of 2016, which was about the need to make organizing the annual conference a more manageable and sustainable process overall. So in particular, this email from Coral Sheldon Hess was super important because she asked for a fact-finding group to evaluate what kind of options might be possible for Code for Lib. Um, in this email, she just said, let's make this happen. It was a really great idea, and we're really grateful to her for advocating for it and for all the work that she's put into the whole project. One of the things that this discussion was about was that the process for, that Code for Lib has used so far for organizing conferences has been a big challenge because it's meant that we had to find a new fiscal host for the conference every year. This is since Code for Lib is not an official or legal organization, there needs to be some other entity that can take financial responsibility and sign contracts for the conference. So finding an institution that could take this on is a huge burden for the local planning committee each year. And it's also a lot to ask of the institutions that have provided this for us. The conference has also gotten larger each year, so the budgets have gotten larger, and it's a, big, it's a really big risk for an institution to take on. So overall, it's just extremely time consuming, and it's stressful and inefficient for everyone who's been involved. So Jamie and Galen will talk more about this. But that was the main challenge that the Fiscal Continuity Group was looking for alternatives to. So we formed in the summer of 2016, and we're focused on fact finding and figuring out the kind of options for greater fiscal sustainability that were possible for Code for Lib, but also thinking about and evaluating how these options related to the values and the history of our community, which is officially or intentionally not an official organization. Like it's not by that hap like that happened by accident or like no one got around to it yet. I mean, that was like so far that's, that's been a conscious choice. So we wanted to think about these things in that context. We wanted to consider a wide range of options, so we started from a long list of possibilities, and we talked about these as a group. We narrowed the options to the three best pathways, and we decided to write a report to present information about these options to the community. So, so far, I'm just up to like last year at the conference, which I think Galen gave a lightning talk about. The three options that the report is about were, um, one, maintain the status quo of yearly fiscal hosts, two, seek out ongoing fiscal sponsorship from another organization, or three, incorporate Code for Lib as its own nonprofit organization. We published uh, that report in January of 2017, and then in the fall of this past year, we had an open community vote on the three options, and also on four possible fiscal sponsors that we um, presented information about that we interviewed um, if, if the community decided to go with option two, these are some options. So that's what the vote was about. We have documentation about the group um, at the Fiscal Continuity Interest Group page at the Code for Lib Wiki. So that has like the list of participants, links to minutes, and also the long list of options that we started from. So to summarize the vote, it happened this past fall. It was open for two weeks. It was open to everyone. There were a total of 310 ballots cast during that time. And the outcome was in favor of Code for Lib staying an independent, non-incorporated community so not any kind of legal entity, and maintaining our current structure and approach to planning conferences, but with the change that instead of trying to find a new fiscal host each year, working with a partner organization that could provide an ongoing fiscal sponsorship. And then of the sponsor options that the ballot laid out that were documented in the report, the vote was in favor, was in favor of um, clear DLF. So at that point, the work of the first group was done, and the next group was to form a working group that would move forward with implementing the options that the community voted in favor of. So I hope Galen will talk about that next. Good morning, uh, everybody. I hope uh, that uh, folks uh, have uh, adequate uh, caffeine uh, if uh, you need it. And uh, I do want to thank everybody uh, for getting up uh, you know, earlier, earlier than you necessarily had to uh, to uh, uh, 
both listen to this uh, presentation and uh, to hopefully discuss it. Um, so, as Morgan said, once um, the community vote uh, was uh, finished uh, last year, um, we ended up uh, with uh, a um, clear license, if uh, you will, uh, for folks uh, to uh, enter into discussions with clear DLF. Um, and um, Code for Lib uh, being what it has been, automatically there is a lot of uh, self-selection. Uh, um, but in January uh, 2018, um, you know, we formed uh, following uh, an initial email uh, to uh, the Code for Lib uh, mailing list, set up uh, a page on uh, the wiki, and then, uh, I must admit to my surprise, ended up uh, moving far more uh, quickly uh, than I uh, could have uh, hoped uh, for. Um, so on the 22nd of January, uh, we met uh, to self-organize uh, the group. Um, at that point, that meeting specifically did not include uh, representatives uh, from Clear DLF in case um, anybody had any concerns or identified uh, issues uh, that we wanted to discuss amongst ourselves first. Um, and then after uh, that uh, meeting um, in January, um, the uh, essentially the following week, uh, we met uh, with uh, uh, Clear at DOF uh, to discuss uh, a draft memorandum of understanding. Um, so of course, you may ask yourself, who is, uh, you know, who are the parties involved uh, in this uh, MOU? You know, obviously, Clear DOF as a nonprofit organization is pretty clear as a legal entity. But what we'll be discussing is what it means for there uh, to be code for lib uh, signing this uh, thing. Um, believe it or not, uh, bootstrapping isn't just uh, for software, uh, it is also uh, for legal organizations. Um, so when we formed, uh, Tim McGarry of uh, Duke um, was uh, chosen as a chair. Um, and what this meant uh, is we had access uh, to uh, the director of uh, copyright and scholarly communications at uh, Duke, uh, who is also an attorney, I believe, uh, and who has uh, been involved uh, in nonprofit uh, formation, who generously uh, reviewed uh, the MOU in addition uh, to uh, the other members of uh, the working uh, group. Um, and in addition to um, our main topic of discussion, which was the annual conference, um, Carol Bean um, joined uh, the working group representing the editorial committee of uh, the Code for Lib uh, journal. Um, and the reason why this matters is the Code for Lib uh, journal has actually been having some royalty monies due uh, to it uh, from EBSCO for, I believe, the past eight years. So if you can imagine an accounting uh, department asking about every year fairly plaintively, is there a bank account that we can send us some money to? Um, you can uh, get a sense of uh, the discussions uh, between the journal folks and EBSCO. Um, and I would let everybody uh, pause a moment uh, to uh, enjoy uh, that uh, mental image. <laughs> um, but what this means uh, is that um, the MOU, in addition to serving the bigger purpose of uh, setting up a you know, ongoing fiscal arrangement uh, for the annual conference, also uh, will give uh, the journal uh, the ability to both hold money and um, expend it um, since um, there have been some ideas floated uh, over the years about uh, things uh, that the journal could do, such as compensating uh, for hosting uh, the journal's website uh, or participating in archiving 
uh, projects of other journals' content or whatever. And then, so, you know, in, you know so this just gives us uh, the ability to tie up uh, a loose end uh, there. So uh, the members of uh, the uh, working group, um, just uh, to acknowledge uh, the people who have uh, contributed uh, to it, Carol Bean, uh, Tim McGeary as chair, Morgan McKeon, and Chad Nelson, um, and uh, myself. I should mention uh, that uh, Chad uh, has uh, kindly agreed uh, to be present in Slack and IRC during this uh, presentation um, so please feel free to inundate him with all of uh, the questions. Um, so hitherto we have uh, been um, doing um, the cardinal um, bad uh, technical presentation uh, thing of not expanding our acronyms. I will now rectify this. Um, so when we are saying clear DOF, um, we're referring uh, to the Council on Library and Information Resources, uh, which is a parent organization uh, for the Digital Library Federation. And the mission of the Digital Library Federation, uh, to quote, is to advance research, learning, social justice, and the public good through the creative design and wise application of digital library technologies. So, thinking, thinking, what is a group of uh, people who have uh, self-organized around uh, library and other technologies uh, and uh, have an interest in social justice and other considerations? Might even be a code for lab. So yeah, that's of course one of uh, the reasons, uh, you know, you know, to not uh, presume too much on Bethany, why you know, Claire was interested in uh, proposing in uh, the first place, and I'm getting a thumbs up uh, from her. Um, I will also mention that during uh, the Q&A uh, period, Bethany has uh, agreed uh, to accept uh, questions uh, directed at uh, Clear DOF. So bookmark uh, for later in case uh, you don't uh, take my uh, advice uh, to inundate uh, Chad uh, with all the questions. Um, so one of the um, things I should also mention is uh, that uh, CLEAR um, uh, is uh, the current host of uh, the mailing list, list following Notre Dame. So I first want to thank uh, CLEAR for that, uh, but also give a shout out to Notre Dame and uh, Eric Elise Morgan for uh, having uh, run uh, the mailing list uh, for many, many uh, years. So, you know, what are we talking about uh, when uh, you know, we have a memorandum of understanding? So the text of the mem memorandum uh, is on uh, the um, wiki uh, page. Um, there's a link out there in Twitter, or you can, or the working group is also um, linked from uh, the home page of wiki.codeforlib.org. Um, so you can review the full text of the MOU there, um, but. What it amounts to uh, on CLEAR's end is um, CLEAR would act as the banker and uh, the contract uh, signatory uh, for the annual conference and uh, the journal. Um, so that would mean that uh, CLEAR would ultimately be the entity responsible uh, for um, signing an arrangement with a hotel conference uh, center or potentially um, college or public library um, uh, meeting a space uh, to, in, uh, to uh, invite 400 to 500 of our uh, best uh, friends over uh, uh, to talk about library uh, and archives and museum uh, technology. Um, and as such, they would ult ultimately be uh, accepting a you know, large portion of uh, the liability. Um, as part of um, Collecting, hold, uh, collecting and holding uh, payments made to Code for Lib, you know, taken via the conference, um, they would be deposited in a sweep account, which means we get uh, interest uh, income, presumably a small amount, uh, but hey, it's interest uh, nonetheless. Uh, in addition to um, working with uh, conference planning uh, committees, uh, um, 
they would be giving uh, us uh, a semi-annual report, um, both of the accounts of the code for lib, as well as um, doing something they don't have to, sharing um, the results of their own audit um, with uh, a code for lib uh, designee. Um, and I should mention that accepting that liability is huge. Taking advantage of the expertise of uh, the DOF folks in how they've been running their own conferences and events uh, is also huge. Um, but of course, uh, there are some uh, responsibilities on uh, the end of Code for Lib. Um, so this memorandum of understanding covers years uh, where there's uh, an annual conference. Um, that doesn't mean we have to have uh, one every year. It's not uh, an obligation uh, to do so. Um, nor is CLEAR meant uh, to be organizing Code for Lib annual on the community's behalf. The nature of the conference is uh, something that ultimately a group of uh, people um, who unaccountably have, you know, find a lot of uh, time uh, to do it, choose uh, to, you know, throw their hats in uh, the ring and, uh, you know, offer this uh, opportunity. But in years we where we do have uh, a conference, uh, CLEAR would be entitled to a fee of uh, 5000 um, to be uh, taken out of the conference uh, budget uh, for um, services including uh, dealing with uh, legal uh, review of contracts uh, and uh, accepting uh, payments. Um, we would also be asked uh, to maintain a minimum yearly balance of 25000 um, And the main reason for that uh, is um, you can bootstrap computers, you can bootstrap uh, legal entities, um, it's a little difficult uh, to bootstrap uh, payments uh, to get the conference uh, started without uh, somebody putting up uh, some seed uh, money. So the 25,000 would represent the minimum amount that's meant uh, to be on hand to help uh, start uh, the uh, next year's conference. Now that's a minimum. Um, we need uh, to go a bit higher over the long run. But of course, you know, in the long run, we also potentially have uh, the issue of um, having enough money on hand that we don't necessarily just want to keep it in a bank account. And we might want to do things like uh, fund uh, more diversity scholarships or do other arrangements. Um, this is also a good point uh, to mention that um, the MLU covers the annual conference. Regional conferences, at least at uh, the moment, uh, are not covered uh, by that. So if you want to organize a code for lib um, in your own city, you can do that. You don't have to ask anybody's uh, permission. Um, if, you want a, if you need a fiscal uh, host at the moment, it's your uh, responsibility uh, to arrange it. So what else is a code for, for lib uh, responsible for? Um, since um, it would probably take a while uh, for us uh, to finish uh, the meteorite uh, defense uh, system, you know, we would be asked uh, to get uh, event uh, insurance. Our sponsors who have been in the calls always know there's always a point in the conference call where I say, yeah, I'm worried about time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to make sure everyone has time for questions. Yeah, and uh, we'll try to make sure that there's uh, at least uh, 10 minutes uh, for questions. Um, okay. Or 15, okay. <laughs> um, so moving uh, you know, forward a little uh, you know, faster, folks who would be acting as the local planning uh, committee for the conference uh, would be asked uh, to budget uh, for conferences prudently. Um, and there's also a request um, to continue the process, uh, practice of hiring professional conference uh, planners and services. Uh, because as you may have uh, noticed, Code for Lib is not just uh, 80 people in a room anymore. Um, you know, the last number I heard uh, was 476. Uh, I think it might uh, be a, a little higher. Um, and we need, um, you know, and we can't frankly do it all on a volunteer labor. 
Um, so whether it's potentially the event planning at department of a host at university or um, the uh, firm whose ser services we've had, you know, various conferences have, have been using in recent years, um, we do need uh, the help. Um, so the primary contacts uh, with the CLEAR would include uh, the current and past chair, chairs of uh, the Code for Lib Conference local planning uh, committees, um, and uh, as well as uh, the potential, uh, yeah, as well as a representative uh, from uh, the journal's uh, editorial uh, you know, committee. And to reiterate, this is ultimately our conference Ours uh, to organize um, CLEAR is uh, just giving us the fiscal basis on which uh, to do so without um, uh, uh, you know, risking um, direct uh, financial harm either to the individuals running uh, the conference or to uh, their host uh, institution. So at this point, I'd like uh, to ask uh, Jamie from Library of Congress to speak about her experience working with uh, CLEAR. This is gonna be really brief, so we have plenty of time for discussion. I just wanted to um, talk specifically about what it took to do this conference this year um, and what uh, we felt DLF uh, did for us during that process. So I have three main points. Um, the first one that I'll say is that uh, Bethany, who was our uh, main contact there, she also volunteered um, on our budget committee and uh, met with us weekly. And DLF, as you know, probably many of you have attended DLF conferences in the past. There's a lot of similarities, Galen mentioned this too, about what DLF stands for as a community that overlaps with Code for Lib. And she was able to bring um, a lot of expertise to bear for um, a local planning committee that didn't have um, any experience in doing this before. So for example, it was Bethany actually that suggested that we use the Open Science Framework Repository, which has been a success of this conference um, for everyone to upload their presentations. Um, she also suggested ev event insurance, um, which is something that we wouldn't have thought about. Um, alternatives for childcare that we hadn't thought of before. Um, and in general, just as I said um, in my opening speech, wise counsel that was very desperately uh, needed to make sure that this was pulled off without a hitch. Um, secondly, uh, and this is um, just an essential need, we needed some kind of monetary cushion when we started rolling. Um, there was money from the last conference um, that we ended up receiving, but because of some bureaucratic hurdles, it took a while. Um, and there were deposits that needed to be made kind of right off the bat when we were planning. So DLF was able to front that money for us as we were waiting for sponsorship funding to come in, um, and that was a necessity that we very much appreciated. And then lastly, volunteers. So I wasn't really sure what to expect in this partnership um, besides uh, seeing uh, Bethany weekly on the budget committee, but there are multiple uh, DLF volunteers that are here um, that have served um, to get this conference rolling, and I feel that they've done a fantastic job, job in meshing with our community and making it feel that it, it is a Code for Lib experience, but also with their support. So those are the three things that I wanted to say and just personally wanted to say thank you. I think this conference is a success, and it would not have been so if you guys um, hadn't agreed to be a fiscal host. And uh, thank you, uh, Jamie. Um, so at this point, uh, we'll give uh, the nutshell uh, description of how conferences have been run. Um, so you'll hear the acronym LPC, Local Planning Committee, um, by tradition, and it's only by a tradition they've uh, received um, whatever excess money um, was available from uh, the previous uh, year. Um, and one of the other things to keep in mind is that Code of Lib has uh, been a growing. Um, last year, uh, there were 404 uh, attendees of the full conference. We have uh, 476. Uh, recent years, we've uh, been bouncing between 350 and uh, 450. Um, as I mentioned, we do need uh, professional conference organization services um, because 
we are already asking a lot in terms of uh, time uh, on the part of uh, every conference uh, volunteer. Um, but we're well past uh, the point uh, where anybody uh, can do it all by themselves, even if uh, their employer is generous enough uh, to give them a lot of uh, release time, uh, paid release time uh, to work on code for lib. Um, and there have been difficulties uh, with uh, the increase in uh, the conference. Um, code for lib 2017 nearly didn't happen. And it was only um, in part uh, because of a last minute rescue by UCLA that uh, we were able to turn Code for Lib uh, Southeast into Code for Lib Southeast if you look at it from the point of view of uh, the uh, Northern Pacific Ocean. <laughs> um, so just uh, some numbers. Um, we're now looking at uh, conference uh, budgets uh, that are in uh, the range of a quarter of a million uh, dollars. Um, so last year there was a loss of a bit over $7,000. Um, this year we're expecting to run a profit of about 14,000, but it's a profit that in turn will be moving over to uh, the next uh, conference. Um, so most of our revenue is coming from registration, about uh, a quarter from sponsorship, uh, and then hotel rebates and room credits uh, amount for the rest. Um, the venue is about a third, AV and, inter uh, and internet. High Wi-Fi, high streaming um, uh, accounts uh, for about a quarter, uh, and various other expenses. Um, scholarships, uh, by the way, are, have historically been set up as a self-funding uh, thing. We pay for as many scholarships as we receive in sponsorships and angel fund uh, donations. And yeah, this is expensive, both to run and uh, as uh, folks I'm sure have uh, been noticing, the registration fees uh, have uh, been going up. But one of my hopes uh, is that uh, an ongoing fiscal sponsorship structure means that we will be able to have some opportunities to reduce costs, both uh, by making it possible for smaller institutions that still nonetheless have access to a large enough ballroom to host uh, the conference, uh, as well as uh, giving us uh, the ability uh, to plan further in advance. So very briefly before uh, we open up uh, the floor to questions, um, the draft uh, MOU is out there. It's now available for everybody to read. Um, it's also available uh, on a poster board in uh, the back uh, for you to uh, review. And if you uh, feel inspired to, to sign it uh, symbolically. Um, we'll have uh, open uh, discussion uh, through March 1st, and then since ultimately Code for Lib is a democratic organization and we want to make sure that we proceed with uh, community assent, um, a yes, no uh, you know, th uh, you know, uh, survey running through March 15th. And then at that point, Code for Lib uh, if the community approves, a member or two of uh, the uh, fiscal sponsorship working group will um, you know, sign uh, the MOU and it uh, will be something that is out there and ability and able to be there as a vehicle uh, for future code for libs. Um, and I should mention and reiterate um, that in the interim, if there is any group um, that uh, is interested uh, in uh, hosting the conference in 2019, regardless of the outcome of and timing of the MOU process, CLEAR DOF has very generously offered uh, to act as a fiscal sponsor uh, for the next host uh, that the community chooses. So if you are at all worried uh, about uh, your home institution, um, not being able to uh, you know, deal with the liability, we have a solution for you. And please don't hesitate uh, to get in touch uh, with uh, Peggy uh, Griesinger as um, head of the 2019 uh, um, you know, selection uh, committee, Bethany, um, or any uh, mem of the members of uh, the working group, or past uh, conference organi organizers if uh, you have uh, any uh, questions. 
Um, so again, um, you know, if uh, you want to host in 2019, hopefully it's going to be easier. I will not say it's going to be easy, uh, but hopefully easier. Um, so at this point, uh, we'd like to thank you. Um, the rest of the uh, slide deck um, does have uh, some additional links and comments um, uh, you know, that you can look at online. But at this point, I would like uh, to open uh, the floor to questions. And as a reminder, if you want to ask uh, questions of Bethany in her role as a DOF uh, representative uh, directly, um, you know, feel free to do so. Hi, um, <clears throat> Roy Tennant. As a member of this community, since before we began to have conferences, I just have huge respect and appreciation for what you guys have done for us to bring us to this point. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just some stuff. All right, so these are some main points, um, just to kind of like go through, that was a lot of information. Um, in case anybody has questions about these, feel, feel free to ask about any of these. So right now, as far as the process for how it'll work, the working group is um, drafting an agreement and that's what's online. Did everyone access, can you see the, the link to the, to the PDF for the MOU? Um, so that, that's the current state of it, you could take a look at it. And um, that will be signed by a representative of the Fiscal Sponsorship Working Group. And that person will be a representative of that group and of Code for Lib, right? But not, but it just, it, it can be one person or it can be more than one person. So that's kind of a detail about um, the fact that Code for Lib will not be an official organization, but how does a person sign for it? Like that's how that works. Feel free to ask questions about that if you have any. That's what Galen was talking about. Um, the financial responsibilities, it'll be the 5,000 annual administrative fee, as we mentioned, and then the reserve account. I know that's like money, but feel free to ask about that. Yeah. Hi, Laura Ackerman. Uh, can you, for the legally um, naive, uh, give a picture of the, maybe the difference between a memorandum of understanding and a contract, yeah, if there's one. Yeah, I don't want to say the wrong, I'm not sure. Do you, mm. Are you able to speak to that, Dylan? Uh, and if you're not either? Yeah. Bethany, I'm sure, <laughs> definitely can. Uh, or, or if Bethany doesn't want to be put on the spot, we will get back to you. I know a hundred archivists who can. I am not a lawyer, <laughs> so I need to say that first. Um, MOUs are something that we've entered into with other similar communities. They're a little less formal than a contract, and they're often appropriate for a situation in which the other group is not a formal entity that you could sort of, you know, locate and sue or, or whatever. So, um, so that's, that's my sort of layman's understanding of the difference between a contract and an MOU. So in order to put on this conference, there were a lot of contracts that we signed with vendors, with you know hotel and that sort of thing. Um, but this would be more like uh, an understanding. But that's, I think that's a really good point. And since we're using that term, and since we have that on the, um, Fiscal Sponsorship Working Group Wiki page. I think we should define that, so I'll make sure to, um, I'll put a definition in there so it's clear. No pun intended. Uh, it's not as good as the foul language pun yesterday. So uh, I have a follow-up question about the bootstrapping in particular, um, and maybe just because it's early, um, I'm not sort of processing the, the financials. Uh, do we feel, Based on the current state of the finances from the carryover, the expected carryover from this year, um, where do we potentially fall? 
um, in terms of that bootstrapping. Right. Um, so, um, since uh, given both uh, the expected uh, net gain from the conference uh, on top of uh, what was carried over from last year, we are expecting a carryover of about 39,000. Um, and based on previous experience, that's been more than enough uh, to um, start up a conference, uh, both by playing, you know, doing initial deposits uh, for the event planner, uh, as well as depending on the exact details, and they can vary wildly um, deposits necessary to secure a venue. Um, so just to keep going through these points also, um, the other thing is that we mentioned is there's the recommendation that the chairs of the local planning committee, that would be a way to establish continuity. So it would be like the previous year and the current year um, would be the link for how that, um, how that would work. And, and that you mentioned this also, but that that would be something to take into consideration then when host sites in their proposal that there would be um, that'd be that'd be part of the agreement to, that, that, would, that they would know that that's what they're signing up for as far as the rest of the slides if anyone has if questions occur to you later please feel free to post them on the main list we'd like to do that for transparency so that everyone can see any questions that come up and we can discuss them there but if you don't want to for any reason at all you can write to our Google group address for the fiscal sponsorship working group so that, that's that address. Or if you don't want to write to a group at all, you want to write to an individual, um, feel free to contact any of these individual emails as well. And if you don't want to deal with email, um, feel free to send me an email and I'll give you a call if you don't want to like talk via email. Um, just want to make sure that everyone has a chance to talk about any concerns or questions that come up. And then the last slide is just resources for all the stuff that we went through. Um, so, any other questions? Someone's got to have a question. I give Galen such a hard time <laughs> <laughs> about time. Okay, so uh, if uh, not, I would. I think I'm just a little confused. I hope you can clarify. Is the head of the LPC for the previous year expected to be on the LPC for the next year or just expected to be available as a point of contact um, from clear DLF? Um, the previous year's LPC is uh, expected to primarily be a point of uh, contact uh, and uh, to um, help with handover meetings uh, in uh, the following year's LPC, but uh, they are not uh, by any stretch uh, required uh, to uh, otherwise uh, participate in organizing the following year's conference. Thank you. Chad, have there been any questions about Slack or over Slack? All right. Okay, um, so Thank you very much, um, and uh, again, if uh, you have uh, any questions, please don't hesitate uh, to use the mailing list, to contact us over email or individually, and thank you so much uh, for uh, your attention to a presentation that has no slides of uh, source code whatsoever. <laughs>
So I'm not sure how that's going to work. So I'm going to wing it, which is the best way. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to have some giveaways now, but we're going to pause. We're going to hold off on the giveaways. So let me, and so I'll do my announcements. And then you're going to run out and have your coffee and sign up for breakout sessions. And some person out there, I don't know who, but you're out there, is going to figure out after the breakout sessions get signed up for what rooms they're going to be in. And then we're going to reconvene here at 10 o'clock for the giveaways. And also, I will tell you where the breakout sessions are. Um, and then at 10.05, we will have breakout sessions until 10.55. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So. Now, it is time for the thanking of the bronze sponsors, which are many in number. The bronze sponsors are as follows. Crossref, thank you very much for your closed captioning support. Lyricist, Ex Libris, Johns Hopkins Sheridan Libraries and University Museums, University System of Maryland and Affiliated Institutions, Rutgers School of Communication and Information, University of Maryland College of Information Studies, Emory Libraries, the iSchool at Illinois, Ithaca with a K, Penn State University Libraries. Thank you very much, bronze sponsors. The next note says, coffee available if you want it. We all know what that means. Um, so uh, I would like to get the people who are in the afternoon session um, to put their slides on the podium machine if they haven't been there. Um, Sign-ups for lightning talks are also available in the lobby. So if you would go, go forth and caffeinate and sign up for breakout sessions, sign up for lightning talks, be back here at 10 o'clock for giveaways and to find out where your breakout sessions are going to be. Thank you. Um, one thing I realized when I was thanking Roy earlier that I called him my savior and I realized that might have uh, minimized some people's religious beliefs, so I apologize for that. I did not mean any offense. Um, so let's see what we've got going on here uh, today. So we did our giveaways. Uh, I hope breakout sessions were good. Um, I think we're just going to go straight into our first presentation, which is uh, Python for Data Transformation by Jason Klingerman. Let me just make sure the thing does the what's it with the who's it. Uh, where's my mouse? It's, is it, uh, uh, there we go. Eh. This is the part of the Dre emceeing where he makes weird noises. Uh, slideshow uh, from beginning using presenter view. And can we, hey, there we go. All right, so here we go, Jason. All right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jason. I'm from the US National Archives. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we started using uh, Python for data transformation, and it really became a game changer for us as an agency, and really helped us rethink the way that we do things and do our work in general. So, uh, so for over a decade now, we've had partnerships with various organizations like Ancestry.com, Fold3.com, FamilySearch, to digitize our records and also capture metadata about them. Um, when these partnerships were initially established, there was little to no forethought about um, the, the format uh, of this metadata or how we would actually incorporate it into our um, online catalog. So, you know, they were chugging along and digitizing hundreds of millions of images and creating all this metadata, and nobody at our agency had kind of communicated with them and said, like, hey, what's it going to look like so we can prepare and start to ingest this? Um, so the way that these partnerships work is basically after five years of being available on their website, um, we then get the images and metadata and then we can make them available on our website. Um, so a lot of people had this expectation that like five years on the day, things were gonna become available and we really ran up into a challenge because we were not prepared for what we received. And so uh, basically we got a ton of stuff. Um, the metadata was in a format uh, that was unique to each partner's platform, so it wasn't like a standard format across all partners. And we also have our own little unique data structure um, that is kind of its own special snowflake that uh, we had to fit that into. So the challenge is how do we get this metadata into a format that we can use for the National Archives catalog? So the early days of this, when we actually started processing this stuff, 
Um, we used a combination of tools. This is almost embarrassing to talk about. Um, we used uh, Microsoft Excel. Uh, specifically, we used a bunch of formulas to try to merge metadata together into formats that we needed. And then from there, we would actually use Microsoft Word's mail merge function to plug those values into an XML structure and then um, export that into a giant uh, Word document, and then we would copy and paste and save that as a, an XML file. It's, it's really embarrassing to talk about. We also had this tool, because all this stuff was, uh, after we got the hard drives, we uploaded it all to S3, and we had this tool that we paid a vendor to develop for us that was called, they named it S3 Manifester, um, and it basically uh, allowed us to search our S3 storage and find where the images for each of the, the sets of records we were working with were actually located and get those file paths to help us integrate into the metadata. Um, the problem was, was that that tool was built to work with one specific bucket, and as our S3 presence really grew, um, we couldn't customize it to point to different buckets. It was um, not open source. Uh, I tried to decompile it. We, we couldn't. It was just gobbledygook. So we were like really running into a wall. Um, so uh, in a nutshell, the challenges in those early days were what we were doing was really labor intensive. It was super manual and took a lot of time. Um, Microsoft Office tools also really couldn't support the amount of data that we were scaling to. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever tried to open uh, a CSV or an Excel file that has more than one million lines on a computer with four gigabits of RAM. It, it cuts off at one million, I think, and it just stops and doesn't go beyond that. So um, it doesn't work. And uh, then there was the, the, our, our little tool. Um, so we started thinking that there, there really had to be a better way to do this. We had one staff member that had a, a working knowledge of Python. He was by no means a programmer, um, but he was familiar with Python. He's our Wikipedia in residence. Shout out to Dominic. Um, and he actually, uh, I tasked him with this challenge of like, hey, is there any way that we could use Python to make this a lot easier for us? So he actually arrived at a working script that could transform uh, metadata from one of the partners in specific um, and, and reformat it into our our metadata. So it was like this amazing transformational moment where we were like, oh my gosh, we actually did this. Um, so the problem was though is that none of our other staff had any Python experience. So we basically rushed to get people just like familiar with Python to even understand like the syntax and just the basics of what Python can do, just so that they could rework the script that somebody else wrote. So nobody, none of them were writing their own scripts. Um, we were reworking a script that one of our staff members developed. Uh, and that script is, is what we're still using to this day. It's probably not the most efficient script in the world, but it really, it really opened up a whole new world for us. It really made us realize that we could use Python for a lot of other challenges we were facing. So we actually have a Python script that mimics our S3 manifestor tools, and now we're just using Bodo 3 to search our S3 storage and get all the file paths back in the format that we need. Um, we're splitting large CSV files into uh, intellectual groupings that we need to process this stuff. Um, we can combine XML processes, uh, XML files for importing and stuff like that. Um, we can scrape other metadata from S3 buckets, like file sizes. Um, and another thing that we're doing it for is we're using, um, we're converting multi-page PDFs into JPEG files. A lot of the stuff that was digitized in the early days and also stuff that we digitize as an agency that comes from FOIA requests um, is output in PDF format uh, because that's just the way it is. And um, for us to actually, um, get citizen archivists to transcribe and engage these records. We have to have them in JPEG format because of our platform limits the character, number of characters for a transcription, so we have to do it page for page. So we basically were splitting those PDFs into JPEGs now also and providing both um, in the catalog and, and, and a bunch of other data transformation challenges that we faced. So I have this little graph to show kind of to, to prove what, what Python did for us. Um, we were kind of chugging along in the old way, um, really, not seeing a lot of gain for our effort. And then when you insert Python, you can see that we really scaled up almost logarithmically like to, to, to boost the number of images that we made available in the National Archives catalog. Um, you will note in the top right corner, it's starting to peter out a little bit. That's another challenge that we're facing that I'm not really gonna delve into today. That could almost be a whole nother presentation about um, throughput because we have thousands of hard drives and we're trying to figure out the best way to get throughput for those to S3 in a, in a way that will allow us to have intellectual control over them, so that's, I won't go too much into that. So um, I kind of wanted to break down what our process is. Um, 
Please note that we're all Python novices, uh, so part of the reason I'm presenting to you today is not to brag about what we've done, but to actually appeal to you guys, if anyone's interested, to actually look at our scripts and see, hey, you could be doing this a lot better. Um, so we have this all on GitHub. Um, I put the URL on there if anyone wants to follow along. I'm gonna show pieces of the code, but it really doesn't look great up here. It doesn't look nearly as good as that uh, um, presentation yesterday for the pi call numbers, that, that was great looking. Um, but uh, so we basically use a series of four scripts and we use them in a sequence. So the first script basically, it, it's what I mentioned, it replaced that S3 manifestor tool. It generates a CSV file listing all the digital uh, file paths um, and also other metadata like file sizes that we need for our metadata. Um, and then the second one splits that CSV into smaller segments because it could be pretty large. Uh, and we want them to be grouped intellectually. So for example, we might want to split them out by microfilm roll number um, to help us better um, marry it with the metadata that we have from the partners, which is organized that way. And then the third script is really where the magic is happening. Um, this is where it reformats the partner XML into our XML and then marries those file paths within our XML um, to allow us to import it to the National Archives catalog. And then the last script is kind of just a wrap-up script. We get these, all these little XML files that are um, mimicking the intellectual grouping that the partners used in their metadata, and then we're basically merging them into these giant files to pump back into our system. Um, it also does little things like adds an import header and footer. Uh, we can specify the file size because our metadata structure is very dense, and so um, sometimes we have so much uh, metadata in there that our imports fail. So uh, what we do is like the more errors we run into for a specific collection, we'll tweak the file size downwards for imports. So that's uh, what that script does. It allows us to control the XML file sizes. So I'm gonna delve a little more into that third script where I said the magic happens, um, where the reformatting is actually happening. <coughs> so this script is taking the partner XML and transforming it into a more usable temporary XML. Um, so basically it's, it's taking um, name value pairs that is in the partner XML and then it's taking the names, converting those to XML tags and then putting the values between those tags. Um, we, for our purposes, this is what we had to do to get this to work. So again, I'm not saying this is the most efficient way to do it. I'm hoping somebody one day will tell us, hey, you should really be doing this better. Um, but this is what we're doing. And it also, uh, will error out the missing roles. So lots of times partners will maybe not have sent the whole uh, collection or they'll send it all in chunks and we don't want to process it all at once because we don't want to wait for it. So we'll just process um, a, what we have and sometimes uh, it'll, this, this script will identify the missing roles for us to make sure that we go back and don't miss those going forward so eventually we can get the whole collection. Uh, the second part of the code, yeah that looks really bad up there. Um, <laughs> Parses the XML uh, for each page, basically, or object. Um, so it basically identifies where um, each, uh, I'm trying to think of the way to say this. It's basically where like the pages have the same metadata about them. So like um, the way the partner did it, it would be like page with metadata, page with metadata, page with metadata. And what we're trying to capture is all the metadata and then lump the pages underneath that, because that's how we're structured. Um, it'll also, if, if no value is found for some metadata, it reinsert the blank value. Sometimes we do this because we wanna actually replace the blank value to make it look better. Um, other times, depending on what the data is, we actually wanna let users know that it was blank because it indicates that somebody looked at this and typed data in for other fields, but for some reason left this field blank because it may have actually been blank in the actual record. So um, there's reasons why we might leave this blank slug in there. It's more so to let users know that um, somebody actually took the time and looked at it and captured that there was nothing there. So there's value in knowing that nothing's there. The next section of the, the code um, just changes, uh, the partners were sending us JPEG 2000s and for our catalog we're converting those to JPEG. Um, so it just changes the JPEG 2000 um, to JPEG at the end of the file name. And then what it does is it actually looks up the file name in that CSV that we generated previously and it plugs into the appropriate fields in the XML um, the file size, the actual file path, and then what we call, what's a label flag, which is basically just the file name. Um, and then this is where we take all the metadata and we create this formula with Python and we basically create a title out of it. Because our catalog, we don't capture all these things as fielded values. We don't have a field for first name, last name, 
Um, it's really unfortunate, and um, we're working towards doing some of that in the future, but as of right now, um, we have a very um, rigid data model, and um, it's, it's, there's a lot of hurdles to go in changing that within the agency. So for now, what we're doing is we're basically slamming this metadata together into a title uh, that is compliant with our internal standards, and we are looking towards external standards, so we're, we're getting there. Um, but uh, that's, that's how we format it now. So actually, in this example, you can see um, <clears throat> this is from a Civil War service record. It's, uh, we're putting the slug in there of what state that soldier was from, and then we're putting their last name, first name, age, year, and military unit they served in. So that was all fielded in the partner data, and we're slamming all that together. Um, then uh, we use all those parse fields and we generate our version of the XML. So we basically have three sections. So what we do is, you know, as I mentioned, the partner metadata is like metadata image, metadata image, metadata image. And we're doing metadata image, 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 and then finish up that um, record and then go into the next one and create metadata image, image, image. So it's basically taking individual groupings of metadata with, with images and combining all the metadata into one section and then wrapping all the images up underneath that because that's just the way ours is structured. And then to wrap it up, <coughs> um, the final code basically creates the actual XML output file. And then it writes the unique titles that we've generated from that formula I mentioned previously to a separate CSV file. Uh, the purpose there is that it actually checks the CSV and um, that's how we verify whether or not it's a unique uh, metadata value. Um, by referencing the CSV. So uh, the reason, we, the CSV is just a temporary um, file that we're using to, to verify whether the metadata matches for a particular image. Um, and if it doesn't, then it creates the new XML. But if it does, it references that last line in the CSV and keeps adding files to that um, metadata. And then at the end, we also have this log file. Um, this is basically just an easier way for us to track progress in the command line. We basically put the, some metadata in a log file and it prints out which one it's working on so we can track progress as we go. And that's how we also, um, it, it prints the errors there as well. So that's uh, that script in a nutshell. I wanted to show you guys what we were working with. So this is the partner as it came from the metadata. Note the name value pairs. Um, it's actually pretty well done. Um, you know, I can't really complain about it. It's, it's more so just a problem on our end of receiving it. And then this is what it looks like afterwards. Um, so this is our XML structure. You can see how much more dense it is. Um, it's very hierarchical. Uh, there's a lot of limitations to it, and we are looking to change some of this going forward. So um, we admit fault here. And I also wanted to point out just kind of what it looks like once it gets into the National Archives catalog. So this is an example where you see the title at the top. That's the title that we generated from various parts of the metadata from the partner. This was all fielded before, those dates, the volume number, the city, the state. Um, and then you can see each of those images in the partner data would have had the same values, but we just wrapped those up all underneath. So just in a nutshell, a bunch of the modules that we found useful, I'm not gonna delve into this. Um, I'm just putting them on here, they're on OSF if anyone wants to look at it. Um, these are the modules that we're using currently, um, and I'm very open, I'm all ears if anybody knows of better modules that we should be using for some of these tasks. So, uh, like I mentioned, I, I'm here to you today not to brag about what we've done. It's, it's nothing magical. Um, but more so to actually appeal to you guys, if anyone's really interested in helping us, to look at our scripts and point out to us how we could be doing things better. And that is the purpose of us putting these scripts on GitHub. Um, we don't have any programmers on staff, so um, we're all novices. So everything we do is just from our rudimentary Python knowledge. Um, we're also facing the challenge of the variations in metadata formats. So we got it down pat for this one partner in their XML, but another partner's XML is very different from that partner, and then another partner is sending us TXT files. So, you know, there's just continuing challenges in how it's formatted. Um, so we're having to rework the scripts every single time. So it's not this like universal script application where we can just throw everything at it. Every single collection we're working with, we're basically reworking the script to work with that collection. Um, we're also facing the scalability challenge. Um, at some point in the future, our systems may actually not be able to support the volume that we're putting out, so simultaneously we are working to scale the catalog to actually be able to support 25 billion objects. I don't think we'll reach that anytime soon, but we want to have a scalable infrastructure so that then we can just kind of pump data in and not have to redesign our system every three to five years. Um, so we're really trying to 
think for the long haul. And then there's, the, there's our IT challenge. I mean, nobody in our IT office even knew what Python was. And um, every time we ask for a new staff member to get it installed to help us with our project or like an intern comes on board, it's always like, huh, what's Python? And I basically have to like sit behind the IT guy to give me admin rights to then install Python on the computer because they just don't know what it is or why we need it. And they're always skeptical and think we're trying to hack the system or something like that. So, so those are our continuing challenges. Uh, and that's, that's not the, the whole list of challenges by any means. Those are just the, the major ones. So um, if you are interested, definitely check out our Pythonic GitHub repos. Um, the one at the top is the actual partner data transformation one that I mentioned. And then we also have one that we just call Nara scripts, which has a bunch of scripts that we use for our work. Um, if you're interested in helping us, and I hope some of you are, um, take a look at those and feel free to add in the issues page where we could be doing things better or feel free to pull and, and try to um, request uh, to push something back to us to make it better. Um, we're, we're very open to that. Um, or if you, for whatever reason in your work, find these scripts useful to you um, and you actually use them, let us know about it. We'd love to hear how people might be using these scripts. So that's all I have for today. I don't think we're doing comments or questions, are we? Oh, okay. Does anybody have any? Questions? Uh, so hi, I'm from Syracuse University and we've been doing a lot with our generated uh, uh, web pages. And I'm just curious, when you're doing this, were you paying attention to web accessibility standards and generating them? In generating the... You know, in the pages you generated from all your XML and everything? Yeah, so technically all our systems have to be Section 508 compliant. Um, so Which is what, okay, 2.0 AA now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we are always thinking about accessibility because we have uh, our legal office is always like telling us like accessibility, accessibility. So um, theoretically the National Archives catalog should be uh, comp uh, accessible. Um, we run it through, um, what do you call those computers that you test accessibility with? Um, Accessibility Jaws, testers. Like I don't know. Yeah. Uh, oh, screen readers. <laughs> yeah, so the, we, we run them through all kinds of different computers that we have for our testing testing folks. Um, so I'm not an accessibility expert by any means. So if you ever notice anything that's not accessible, we're very open to improving that as well. So. Five, four. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit actually about the front end, like how people are getting this stuff? Yeah, so the front end is not great. So um, we're really trying to rethink the catalog's front end um, going forward. Um, it was kind of a, a off the shelf product that we have tweaked and made custom to date. Um, the problem is, is that people really want to search up most of these records because most of them are genealogical records. People want to search them by first name, last name. That's what they expect, and it's a, it's a reasonable expectation. But because we don't capture the metadata that way, it's really difficult for people to find that. So if your uncle's name is John Smith, you're typing John Smith, and you're getting like a lot of things that's not that John Smith. So it's not a great front end. Um, I could talk a lot more about this. So if you want to talk more, let me know. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right. Up next, we've got Becky Yos. Let me see if, um, hey, can we pull the thingy up? And I just want to see if her, uh, oh, we got to close that thing. Uh, 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 hey, there we go, look at that. And we'll just make sure that it is ready to go. I think you might have to click on this guy, and then you'll be able to use the keyboard. All right. All right, let's get this started. So, good morning, everyone. I have. Thank you. I have foiled everyone's plans yet again and am back presenting this year, this time on striking a balance between privacy and analytics with library data. First, some housekeeping. The bibliography and slide, slide links for this presentation are on the slide. This presentation will not get into a comprehensive evaluation of all de-identification methods. You will instead find that in the readings in the link above. Finally, to the disappointment of some, this presentation will include equal parts, technical and non-technical information. While we like to think that the technological parts of the data lifecycle are the most important ones, the fact is, is that policy, governance, and organizational culture are equally as important. Consider this your yearly reminder that your technology does not exist in the vacuum. You might remember this information from my lightning talk last year, 
but just in case you need a refresher, the patron data that you have can be divided into two types of personally identifiable information, or PII. The National Institute of Standards and Technology defines PII in two parts, information about you, your name, address, and barcode number, and information that you do that is linked to you, your circulation history, your uh, logging into electronic resource through a proxy server, and any use of a com library computer or Wi-Fi network. You might be wondering where PII lives in the library. If, the data, if data is the new black oil, as many folks say, then libraries are a pretty sizable oil field. The first list on the screen shows some of the major systems that record and store patron data from our integrated library systems, print system, print management systems, research question logs, and so on. The second list shows some areas that we tend to overlook, including security camera, camera footage, card reader logs if patrons need to swipe a card to access the physical library, and program attendance and feedback data. And then we have three items on the second list that are shouting on the screen. These three, paper forms, staff email, and anything that our vendors track, are often overlooked when we look at where P patron PII lives, and they're at higher risks in potential privacy violations. This brings us to two truths about libraries and data. Truth number one, libraries are dependent on data. This is, in part, due to the unavoidable need for data in organizations improving their worth or existence to others. You might have run across some reports talking about the return of investment on your tax dollars funding a particular public library system, proving that you are getting your money's worth. Another example specific to school and academic libraries is using patron data to create a student profile as an attempt to determine the future academic success or needs of that student. In both cases, patron data could be used to rationalize the role of the library in the greater community. Without data, it is hard for a library to build and sustain support from administration, government officials, taxpayers, donors, and other groups that have a direct impact on the operations of the library. On the slide is an example of how we use data to justify existence. This is a Tableau-generated infographic showing the community impact of the Seattle Public Libraries, or SPLs, Wi-Fi hotspot program in 2017. This data can be used to demonstrate the impact of the program to secure the future of the program, as well as funding for additional hotspot units. The second truth is that while libraries claim to be privacy champions, Libraries are complicit in the erosion of privacy with our existing data collection and reporting practices. We don't regularly question what we or what our vendors collect. We don't consistently follow information security best practices. For example, can any of you come up with a solid business case as to why a library needs to collect driver's license numbers like the Indian Head Federated Library System did? They did exactly that, and their data was breached in the fall of 2017. So, to get around that, some libraries try to keep, not to keep any data in-house. However, they run into the situation I explained earlier. No data, no support, no funding, no library. So, how would you use the data in a way that both respects user privacy while at the same time provide the data needed for operational needs? This brings us to what we have been doing at SPL. One way that SPL tries to strike this balance is through our data warehouse, which grew from a 2014 market segmentation project of millennial patrons. This data warehouse strives to be an authoritative source of data for reporting and analysis done by the organization. This slide gives a high level overview of what a data, data warehouse is for those who are not familiar with the concept. First, we need to extract separate data sets from our various systems, including our ILS, vendor systems, and so on. In some instances, we need to transform or manipulate the data to prepare it for ingesting into the database. This happens in our staging area. Once the data is in the database itself, it is set. The data is read only. We can then access this data through various reporting options, including SQL server reporting services, 
Tableau, and Power BI. And for those of you who are following at home or looking at my slides, the notes section on the slide has more technical information about our data warehouse, so go forth and have fun. I want to focus on ETL, or extract, transform, and load, since this is the most vital part of the process in terms of manipulating the raw data to mitigate risk to patron privacy. We try to automate most of the process through direct database connections or C-sharp functions to collect data from data sources. During that process, the data is transformed and loaded via SQL server integration services jobs, ranging from an hourly to monthly basis. The transformation process is done either in system memory or in staging database tables outside of the data warehouse. If we're going to keep as much raw PII data out of the warehouse, any work on it has to be done outside of it. So what exactly happens in the ETL process that protects patron privacy? This is where the concept of de-identification comes in. De-identification methods are designed to protect individual privacy while preserving some of the data set's utility for other purposes, such as longitudinal analysis of library used by patrons, but without attaching real-world identities to the data points in the data set. Some of the practices we use at SPL include creating a hashed unique identifier for patrons using SHA-2 with a salt. This enables us to track individual behavior trends in library use, but without attaching a real world identity to the individual. Truncation of call numbers, system timestamps, and other data to limit risk of re-identification through PII2 data. Obfuscation of certain data, such as the use of age instead of the date of birth. Aggregating demographic data in item circulation tables and limiting crosswalking between tables with shared data fields. These practices help mitigate the risk of re-identification. And how can you re-identify someone using de-identified data? One way is through searching PII2 data for identifying patterns. In 2006, American Online, or AOL, released millions of search queries to researchers they believe that they have removed PII data from the set they released. But the search logs contain so many specific queries for names, institutions, addresses, and so on, that researchers were able to reconstruct specific identities from various search terms that they identify as belonging to distinct individuals. The New York Times profiled one such case. Some of the terms that belong to user 4417749 were fairly generic and may only give you hints of the user's age, marital status, and that they were probably the owner of a dog. Researchers knew from previous research that people tend to search a lot for themselves and relatives, so they inferred that so many of the search terms were for the last name Arnold, user 4417749 might be an Arnold. Finally, they found search terms that provided more clues about 4417749's whereabouts, which happened to be a very small town in Georgia. By process of elimination, they were able to pinpoint Pinpoint Thelma Arnold, a 60-something-year-old dog-owning Georgian. Another way to re-identify data is through fuzzy matching with under other unrelated data sets. For example, let's say that two tables, a patron table and a circulation table, both share the transaction date field. Now, if there are enough transactions during that particular day, one would have some difficulty in determining which patron checked out a particular title that day. However, if those two tables share an additional field, checkout location, then folks have another data point where they can get a bit more precise in seeing what patron checked out exact titles. A recent real-world real world example involved the New York City taxicab data set, where people were able to identify taxicab passengers using the pickup and drop-off locations and the medallion number from the cab data set, along with other data points from outside data sets including pictures from a Google image search. In summary, de-identification de is a powerful tool, but like other tools, improper imp implementation can lead to a false sense of security. At SPL, we strive not only to de-identify our data in the warehouse, but also consider if the data should be included in the warehouse in the first place. Which leads me to the non-technical part of the case study. I mentioned that technology is only one part, and there's a huge non-technical non uh, 
technical component in how about we go collecting data. You can't protect the privacy of your data if you don't know what you have. Data inventory audits are a very good first step in capturing major data sets, but they don't capture everything. I learned about several high-risk data sets, not through audits, but through offhand comments and casual off conversations or through interdepartmental meetings. Having an active presence in your organization helps with tracking smaller, but potentially higher risk data sets. Policies are key in determining not only how data is treated, but also sets the tone in the organization. Changes in policy are not easy though. For example, I've tried to push for a more comprehensive po privacy policy at SPL, but haven't been able to get very far. This is where the data governance piece falls in. While the launch has been slow going, the Data Governance Committee will formalize the way that the organization handles the data lifecycle by taking on decisions regarding data privacy, what data should be kept in the warehouse, what data is authoritative, and how SPL should approach data-driven practices while respecting patron privacy. Now, data warehouses and other in-house applications don't necessarily mean that library administrators won't look elsewhere. Nonetheless, if you build relationships within your library, particularly ones with decision makers, you can mitigate risk to patron privacy when working with vendors. Case in point, our marketing department wanted to do targeted marketing to patrons based on what services and resources they used. While we did have a very high level of data outside the data warehouse that would allow our marketing department to do those mailings, um, based on certain use on certain electronic resources, they instead went for a third party customer relations management system that required for us to upload patron data. Thankfully, we had two strategies to reduce the risk to patron privacy in this regard. The first was a vendor contract addendum that not only makes the vendor obligated to follow our library pri privacy practices, but also shifts the liability brought on by data leaks and breaches onto the vendor and that back to the library. The second strategy was limiting what data the vendor had access to. By working with the marketing department and determining what was the minimum amount of data needed to meet their business needs, we gave the vendor a data set that did not include high risk PII data. The vendor was, wasn't exactly pleased with this approach, but in the end, they worked with what we gave them. After all that, what can others glean from SPL's case study? Solely relying on technology to achieve a balance between privacy and analytics will not work. Organizations who push for data-driven practices need more than a data warehouse or a vendor data analytic tool. We need to have good working relationships with administrators, comprehensive privacy policies, and staff training and, staff training and education, to name a few strategies. My time at SPL has seen slow progress, particularly on the non-technical changes, but that is because the organization, like any other, is dependent on data as a means to justify their existence in the greater community. We need to cultivate a culture that understands that doing data for the sake of data is, sacrifices privacy in the process and that there are responsible ways of handling data that creates a data-driven practice environment while keeping the privacy of patrons mostly intact. SPL is lucky enough to have technical resources in-house to build the data warehouse it has now. We have a dedicated staff person who has the technical skill and knowledge to build and maintain this database. We are also lucky to have a large enough service population that, can, that we can do de-identification without a high risk of re-identification. Many de-identification me methods have varying re identification risks. Many libraries have demographic outliers in their service populations, such as a zip code that has a very small population, degree program that is historically small, or just have smaller overall service population than SPL. Again, it only takes three to four data points to start re-identifying data, which makes many de-identification methods not viable for many libraries. No matter the size of the data set, giving vendors your data won't change the fact that you have a data set that is vulnerable for privacy violations or security breaches. This is where we drag vendors along in practicing good data, pra 
privacy practices through contract addendums, pooling resources between libraries to fund vendor infrastructure changes, and not accepting the default data collection and storage settings. Finally, protecting patron privacy is not about retreating or straight up refusing to participate in data privacy conversations. Instead, this is the moment for us to lead and shape the conversation. Libraries loudly champion the idea of intellectual freedom, and yet we are followers in data privacy beyond some relevant bits in intellectual freedom. In 2017, I gave a talk to Seattle technology workers about data privacy practices. A worker from a major tech library technology vendor was at that talk, and at the end he said, well, we haven't heard anything from libraries about data privacy, so as long as we don't hear anything, we ain't gonna change anything. So yes, people are paying attention to what we say, or in this case, what we don't say. We don't push for data privacy practice reform in libraries because we are too scared to challenge the ongoing sanctification of data, lest we lose a powerful tool to justify our existence. But when we do push, we're not gonna see success right away. Vendors also have limited resources. The tools that we have in-house are imperfect. Our organizational culture might be slow to change, and unfortunately, we work in a profession that tends to punish people who speak up. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. By showing that through technology and that through policy and that through relationships with decision makers that we can use data in a way that still provides the necessary means to argue for our organization's survival without violating the trust of patrons in the process. Many of you might not have the direct power to change your organization's practices but you know who can. Retreating and staying silent on library data privacy is not, and was never, nor will be, an ethical option for us. My charge to you then is to advocate for this balance in your organizations. Thank you. Matthew Reedsma. Um, I guess there's a bunch of people in the back who maybe would like a seat, and there's plenty of seats, so let's take a second if you're in the back and you want to grab a seat to come grab a seat. Uh, there, there's tons here in the front and over here and at the edges, so take a moment there. Meanwhile, I'm going to fussily fuss with some stuff on the thing to get the thing to do the thing. Um, and do, 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 and do, do, do. Cute changes. Oh, we lost the background. That's interesting. Um, and where is that slideshow from? Which one is it? Is it this one? That's the one. Uh, All right, can we get the thing on the what's it? Hey! Um, all right, uh, so here we have Matthew Reedsma, who's going to talk about auditing algorithms. Thank you. Hi, Code for Lib. Uh, oh boy, let's see. I guess I'm gonna do the clicky. Okay. I do computers. Okay, uh, many library folks have a go-to search that they use to try out different search tools. By using the same terms in many tools over time, you can get a good sense of how a search tool's algorithms perform in comparison to other tools you've used. I tend to use Batman because it's short and the search results will give you a mix of uh, popular and scholarly sources, a variety of formats, and even sometimes things from the 16th or 17th centuries. So this itself is kind of a crude and simple way to evaluate algorithms, but it's ruled more by gut and memory than analysis. In 2015, my colleague Jeffrey Daniels showed me the sum and search results for his go-to search, stress in the workplace. Uh, Jeff likes this search because stress is a common engineering term as well as one common to psychology and the social sciences. The search demonstrates how well a system handles <clears throat> uh, word proximities, and in this regard, someone did quite well. There are no apparent results for evaluating bridge design. But Summon's Topic Explorer, the right-hand sidebar that provides contextual information about the topic you are searching for, had an issue. It suggested that Jeff's search 
for stress in the workplace was really a search about women in the workforce, implying that stress at work was caused perhaps by women. <laughs> I shared it with the Summon team, and within a day, they had blocked the Topic Explorer result. Now, I started looking closer at the Topic Explorer, eventually combing through 8,000 searches that returned a Topic Explorer result and found other problems, mostly in searches related to women, the LGBTQ community, African Americans, Muslims, and mental illness. I shared my results with Summon, and they blocked many of the problematic results, although not this one or any search related to mental illness, which still suggests that it is a myth. It's important to note that they didn't adjust the Topic Explorer algorithm. They hid the problematic results. In my conversations with them, I came to realize that they saw this as a technical problem, not an ethical or moral one. It reminded me of Paul Goodman's quip in the late 1960s about how technology is primarily an ethical undertaking. Goodman's point was that all our decisions about how people live and work and act in the world are fundamentally moral issues. But the growing body of research on critical algorithmic studies confirms that most, if not all, companies that produce algorithmic systems see them, or at least publicly claim to see them, as neutral, objective, technical achievements. The footer of Google News, for instance, reminds us that the stories were selected by an algorithm and not by people, as if that absolves the company of any editorial issues. So if you see biased results as a technical problem, an acceptable solution may be to hide the offending results. But solutions that make sense for technical issues will often be different from solutions that make sense for ethical issues. Now, some of you may know that some of our esteemed colleagues in this very room have pushed back against the idea that these systems are objective, neutral, and exclusively technical. When I began researching library discovery algorithms, I began by reading a lot of critical studies of algorithms, which mostly focus on public commercial systems that use algorithms, like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and the criminal justice system. Very important work is being done by an incredible community of journalists and scholars like Julia Angwin at ProPublica, Zainab Tufaki at the University of North Carolina, and Safiya Noble at the Annenberg School of Communication, whose uh, new book, Algorithms of Oppression, comes out next week. You should buy it. You should buy a copy for your library. I'll wait. While a lot of academics tend to focus on algorithms outside of the academy, I was interested in the algorithms within higher ed that condition the learning environment for our users. So a basic definition of an algorithm is a set of steps used to produce and <clears throat> used to process an input to produce an output. So to begin to audit an algorithm, we might want to know what steps the algorithm takes, either in code or in pseudocode. Like what decisions are being made? What does the algorithm value? But here's the catch. All of the commercial discovery tools consider their search algorithms to be major intellectual property assets. They won't reveal the code or even pseudocode to us. Of course, algorithms are hardly straightforward and linear, and it's unlikely we would be able to make heads or tails out of the code if we had access to it. The people in this room know that better than most. <clears throat> um, and the steps that we build into code are actually only part of the story. The index must be considered too. What the algorithm looks for only makes sense if you understand what it looks at. We don't even know the exact parameters of what is in any discovery services index. Although there is more clarity here because what's in the index comes out as an output. Ah. So we have to look for hints or proxies to help us understand the algorithm since we don't have access to code or pseudocode. In the case of Summon, I started by looking through Summon's administrative settings. Any setting that allowed me to change how results appear or were ranked gave a hint to something that the algorithm valued. The Summon documentation was also helpful. <clears throat> Articles explained what fields were searched, how records were deduplicated and the index was created, how the algorithm determines relevance in very general terms, and how to conduct advanced search techniques such as keyword weighting and proximity searches. Taken together, these help me get a better understanding, although quite fuzzy, of how the algorithm and the index work together. 
I also read through mailing list posts from project managers, specifically around changes to the functioning of the algorithm, and read release announcements carefully. But looking at code or understanding the boundaries of the index will only get you so far, and risks fetishizing the algorithm itself. Al algorithms exist to do something, to create outputs from inputs. You need to see them work. So while the inner workings are still hidden, we can see what kinds of outputs we get by changing inputs. But typing in searches, one at a time, does not scale. Here's my obligatory piece of code. So I captured the results as our users search summon. This has the benefit of showing actual searches rather than hypothetical searches. This is a simplified version of the jQuery function I use to capture search queries and the topic explorer results. That may be the first mention of jQuery for the whole conference. It will also be the last. <laughs> Whenever Summon executed a search and a Topic Explorer result was shown, the script would grab the search query and the heading, source, and text of the Topic Explorer result and send a post request to a PHP script that parsed the data and stored it in a database. This method works for looking at the results of what other people are searching for, but you need to be cautious, as Becky reminded us, about privacy. In this case, searches that bring up Topic Explorer results are very general searches, often only one to two terms. I also didn't save any information about who did the search. They're not tied to any user ID. They're not tied to any other searches anyone did. They're not tied to a t date or time when the search was run. And in doing so, I hope to lower the possibility of capturing re-identifiable data about our users. Now, you could also convert a script like this to a bookmarklet to run on a page where you define a search. Uh, or you could create a bot or a spider to scrape pages and store the results from all manner of algorithms, like search results, database recommendations, spelling corrections, query expansions, auto-suggestions, related topics, related searches, and more. There are some legal concerns with that, and we'll get to those in a moment. No. So I matched 8,000 search queries with their respective Topic Explorer results and released them as a data set if you want to look them over or use them in your research. The data set includes very general search terms and the respective Topic Explorer result for each. 8,000 results, I can tell you, is a lot of results when you are reviewing them one at a time by yourself. But to understand the workings of a complex algorithm, it is not nearly enough. But it's a start. So I shared my data set with the Summon team in advance of publishing my results, um, which looked at the set of 8,000 and found that the Topic Explorer algorithm could generally identify a topic about 90% of the time. This is a good time to note, by the way, that my slides are online and there's a magical bot somewhere that's supposed to be tweeting out links to you. Okay, Deirdre says it's working. The internet. So about 1% of the results that I looked at were biased in some way. The remaining 9% were incorrect, but maybe not all wrong, like this search that equated the ubiquitous marketing concept of branding with bondage, discipline, sadism, and masochism. <laughs> but often the inc incorrect results slipped into bias, reinforcing negative stereotypes, like a search for women in film that apparently couldn't imagine anything more relevant than an exploitation genre. or the tendency of the algorithm to latch onto phrasings like a Mad Libs search engine. Like this search for Sarah Gwyneth Ross's book, The Birth of Feminism, that returned The Birth of Tragedy instead. This is also what uh, was behind the women in the workforce result my colleague Jeff showed me. You could also search for heroes in the workforce and get women in the workforce. Now, if you want to examine an algorithm thoroughly, nothing beats collecting a lot of sample results, but there are other places to look for problems. I wish I knew who the mastermind behind this site was, so if you're here and you want to be outed, please let me know. Uh, but Damn You Autosuggest is a Tumblr with the subtitle, Primo Knows Best, Autosuggest Failures from Library Catalogs and Databases. You can even submit your own. So here Primo suggests that a search for New York City Waste should have been a search for New York City women. 
I've also pro found problematic results from colleagues on Twitter, like this one that Nataline templeman Cluett posted, where Primo thought a search for children's literature could only be made better by transforming it into a search for children's sex literature. But algorithms aren't just code and inputs and outputs. They are used by people to do something, and we need to study those effects too. And this is where my research is taking me. My research is not taking me to using this laptop. <clears throat> So algorithms show and hide possibilities from users, suggesting what a search might really be about or what the parameters of their investigation are. In addition to asking what an algorithm looks at and what kinds of results it returns, we need to ask how it affects the users who interact with the algorithm and its results. This is where ethnography and user research can come in. In the next year, I'll be talking to users and running ethnographic experiments to better understand the impact that algorithmic outputs, both good and bad, have on learning and research. Here is a result that was shared with me by one of our users. It's a known item search for a book on the information needs of LGBT youth that returns only two results, the book and a guide to mental illness. As a researcher, results like these are often the ones that expose the inner workings of the algorithm more clearly. I can look at the metadata for that guide to men mental illness and try to reverse engineer how it got there. They're like the glitches in the matrix. But for the user who was researching and looking for this book, what was the impact of seeing these books next to each other? Looking at inputs and outputs alone won't tell us how these affect our users. Merely returning some relevant results isn't good enough. What we show and don't show matters. So these are challenging, scary, ethical issues. But library search tools are sold by us and vendors as objective places for learning and research. And that's not the case. So part of the reason for auditing our tools is to correct this kind of objective marketing, but also to work with vendors to improve the algorithms of our tools. So a quick word on the responsibility of vendors. If your search tool reinforces and reproduces systemic, racial, gender, religious, and other biases, it doesn't matter if you didn't intend to build a system with those biases. That's what your system does. It is your responsibility to make a system that is fair for all users. Your responsibility doesn't end when we go live with your tool. But. These search results are also the most visible and used parts of our library websites. And so they speak to our users about our values. Yesterday, my fellow Weave Journal of Library User Experience editor, Angela Galvin, gave a keynote speech at Vala in Melbourne. She noted that glitches are the unintentional exposure of values. For those of us who study algorithms, problematic results give us a clearer window into what an algorithm values but our users will read that as what we in the library value. It is our responsibility to ensure that the values we claim to have are what are reflected in our tools. Our responsibility does not end when we sign the license agreement. Well, that was uplifting. <laughs> now I'm gonna to try to recruit you to study algorithms in your library systems because there are some challenges that other algorithmic systems face that we don't have to worry about as much in libraries. For starters, the pressures of capital and wealth creation on the user interface uh, are not as direct in an advertising, uh, in a discovery system as they are in an advertising supported search tool like Google. So there are theoretically no ads in our discovery services. Uh, libraries are supposed to be the paying customer, not the end user. Because libraries license this software, we expect that the vendor won't experiment with new features on our live discovery systems, so no A-B testing to worry about. And as of this moment, none of the vendors appear to be using machine learning algorithms to personalize search results for our users. Uh, it'll get there, but some of them are still using tables for layout, so I think we've got some time. <laughs> we can be pretty sure that all our users are seeing the same results for the same searches, except for some differences in on-campus and off-campus searches. Ah. 
And the content that our search tools index isn't written to be searched by a search engine, like web content is. Much of it isn't written with, a, uh, with the worry that anyone can or will read or understand it, let alone a search engine. So when a result appears in a search, we can be reasonably sure it is there because of the algorithm and not on the part of an assistant professor of botany. So on the other hand, discovery uh, systems have some challenges that other tools don't have. The most obvious is that the search results from my discovery uh, instance won't be the same as yours because of the different collection practices of our institutions. So that doesn't necessarily affect all the supporting algorithms that are kind of sprinkled around the main results, but it definitely affects the results. Uh, trying to understand why something appears in the results can be challenging because items in a discovery services index often blend the varied metadata practices of hundreds of of different database providers into one big messy soup. So this metadata opaqueness can complicate our understanding of how algorithms choose results. There's one more. Don't get too excited. Or maybe get excited. Finally, if you want to study a tool that isn't the one that your institution subscribes to, you may be thwarted by the end user license agreement for the discovery service. Both uh, EDS, the EBSCO Discovery Service, and OCLC's WorldShare prohibit the search interface from being used by unauthorized users, which is basically everyone but currently affiliated students, staff, faculty, or patrons at the subscribing institution. So even if you could use those interfaces, none of us has the time to manually search and record the results. So we'd ideally write a script to do, to do this for us. But the license agreement may also prohibit this. Uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is also so broad that even if the license agreement didn't, you could potentially be in legal trouble from scraping those results anyway. So if you do subscribe to a service, you can probably collect results with a script in the guise of collecting usage data. That's what I did with Summon. Uh, a quick point of order that I cannot emphasize enough. I am not a lawyer. This was not legal advice. <laughs> Please also see the tweet that should have come out right now that says the same thing. So here's my pitch. Help me and all of us better understand our library al uh, discovery algorithms. If you're an authorized user or a representative from EBSCO or OCLC, I'd love to talk to you. The license agreements say I can't use the tools, but they never said anything about me asking another authorized user to collect the search results. But better yet, dive in yourself and examine the algorithms, inputs and outputs, talk to users, and share what you learn. Thank you. We have time for one quick question. Or half a slow question. I have a question. Can you holler it? I'll, re I'll repeat. Run! I have a mic right here. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm curious uh, if there are tools that um, I can use to determine bias in something that I'm, uh, like a search engine that I'm working on. Other than just trying different searches myself, I search something I can just apply. Right. Well, if you're working on it, there are steps you can take, um, and lots of other folks um, have written more eloquently about this than, than I will, and I've learned mostly from them. And there's a link that went out on Twitter to the Social Media Collective's uh, Critical Algorithmic Studies Reading List, which has a whole section of articles written on how to sort of evaluate this proactively. But if you are working on your own tool, one thing that I would start with, um, which is not particularly technical, is just to look as you're designing the algorithm and it, it's making those decisions. Ask yourself what assumptions you are making and make those explicit about why you're choosing those particular values, right? So, you know, I want, if somebody does this kind of a search, I'm gonna select for these particular values, why? Why was that important? What happens if this goes wrong, right? That's a great question to ask. So, but no automated tools that I, that I know of, although it'd be cool to build one. Next year, code for lib. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks once again to our, after, our presenters. Also, not to editorialize, but if it were easy to algorithmically detect bias, it would be uh, a lot harder to 
have algor biased algorithms floating around, right? Um, okay, so announcements before lunch. I realize I am the only thing standing between you and a buffet, um, so I'll try to make it quick. Uh, please, afternoon speakers and lightning talk speakers, uh, 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 please come up here and make sure your stuff is on the machine. Uh, so the people on my list are Liz Wolcott, Sean Avercamp, Ashley Bluer with an L, uh, Matt Miller, uh, Marilis Remus Rojas, which I don't know if I pronounced that even remotely correctly, so apologies. Uh, yeah, and then here's another one, Jir Odell, Jir? Did I do that right? I don't know. Um, if you are one of those people, please make sure your stuff is on a machine up here during lunch. If you signed up for a lightning talk, please make sure your stuff is on this machine during lunch. If you are a poster presenter, plan to set up your posters around 3 p.m. in the back of the conference room. I guess that means back here? I don't really know. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's it, and we are now adjourned for lunch. Well, we get back here at 105. <laughs>